Well, good morning again. Good to see you all. Uh, navigating the church during COVID. Um, man, as we talk about revival, what does that look like and how do, we, uh, how do we really connect with each other? This is kind of an unprecedented time. Uh, a lot of churches are still not meeting in person. Uh, I've been reading a couple recent articles uh, and it talks about uh, the, just the divide across denominational lines that some are radically different, that some denominations hold fast and they say, we're not gonna meet no matter what, uh, not until there's a vaccine and we're safe to do so. Um, you know, and that's their decision and they have the freedom to do that. Uh, there are other churches that say, we're gonna meet, but we're gonna meet in moderation. And then there are other churches that are just completely defiant and they're like, you know what? Um, we're gonna meet and pack as many people in here as we can. Um, and, and, you know, we're kind of all over the place. Uh, so, navigating the church during COVID, what's interesting about this is that there are unprecedented numbers of church splits right now. And the church splits aren't coming over uh, really deeply spiritual matters. They're coming over, um, uh, they're, they're really caused by churches arguing about how to navigate during COVID. Um, what the rules should be, uh, who should attend, when they should attend, whether there's a mask or no mask. Um, on and on and on, and so churches are splitting over uh, some trivial matters. And it's really sad to see. Uh, there is a lot of good going on, and I think there's going to be a lot of good that comes out of this, but church as we know it is changing. That's just a fact. Um, church, traditional church, institutionalized church, as we know it, is changing rapidly. And so the question is, what do we do about that? And I think a lot of people are placing blame on uh, not being able to see people face to face. And they're saying that's really putting a strain on us and uh, people need to see people face to face. And since we can't, you know, online is a good alternative, but it's, but it's not the same as being in person. And so that's creating all kinds of anxiety and that's why we're splitting. Um, I don't really buy that argument, though being face to face is important and there is no substitute for that, that's not a reason to split. Uh, this text that Bill read for us, I'm gonna back up for a second, but Paul's talking about struggling for the sake of other Christians. And he says in this first verse, he says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. And we're gonna go on and, and, and kind of dig into this scripture, but Paul, wasn't seeing a lot of people face to face. And that wasn't a deal breaker. That wasn't like, oh, well, now the church is going to split because we can't see each other face to face. Paul addresses it, but that's not primarily Paul's concern. So I want to suggest that part of what's going on is, is there, there's a lot of spiritual immaturity among Christians, a lot of Christians. There's this article that I found fascinating. This was back from 2017. This was in Relevant Magazine. And the title of the article is Six Ways to Know if You're an Emotionally Immature Christian. And I'm just going to list the six kind of, and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with these, but um, this is after a lot of interviews. And the author just um, kind of found that these were six main indicators. Uh, number one, emotionally immature Christians hate change. And he says change is constant. You can't avoid it. Emotionally immature Christians are anxious about this reality, resisting it at all costs. Well, guys, what, what happened in March of this year? Radical change. Fast change. Painful change. I mean, the face of the church had to change immediately and it had to adapt. And if it didn't adapt, um, in a lot of churches, it's survival of the, of the fittest. Churches that were not able to adapt are suffering greatly right now. But emotionally immature Christians hate change and they'll resist it no matter what. They're the ones that are digging in saying, you know what, we've, all, we've met here for 100 years and we've met in person and never had a problem and we're going to keep meeting in person because that's the way we've always done it. Guess what's happening? Churches are struggling. Number two, emotionally immature Christians don't have many intimate relationships. Um, the, the author says it's possible, even likely, for an emotionally immature Christian to have a lot of connections, 
They might know a lot of people on a first name basis, but they know in italics. They know very few. Emotionally immature Christians don't know how to grow intimacy, which is the stuff of relationships. Um, number three, emotionally immature Christians seek immediate gratification. They, it's kind of ironic. They don't like change, but they want instant um, gratification. They want answers to the questions right now. They want things to change for their sake quickly. But for the sake of the church, they dig in and they resist it. So he says they're highly impulsive and often run, into quick, or run to quick fixes, especially in times of crisis or struggle or pain. Today we're going to talk about struggle. In times of crisis or struggle, they want immediate fixes. And sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. Number four, emotionally immature Christians are highly sensitive and easily offended. Immature Christians need something to be against because they draw energy from winning battles, proving others wrong, and the like. Does that sound familiar? Has anybody been on social media lately? Right? People love starting battles so that they can win battles. Number five, emotionally immature Christians see the world as black and white. The author says they need the world to make sense, so they paint it with black and white. You will often hear, hear them speak in absolutes, never, always, etc. Christians who don't do X never fill in the blank. Or Christians who say X always blah, 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 blah. It's these absolutes that just aren't true. But emotionally immature Christians see the world in black and white. And then the last one, Emotionally immature Christians don't establish and maintain healthy boundaries. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They try to do it all. They don't know how to say no and become trapped into doing a bunch of good things at the expense of their personal and spiritual health. Um, I think all of us can probably relate to that. We all get sucked into this. That's human nature. So the question is, what do we do about that? Um, I want to go back and look at the scripture again. We're going to back up a little bit. This is, um, this is in chapter 1. Bill read from chapter 2. We're going to back up to the last part of chapter 1. Paul's ministry to the church. Paul says this. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings, dot, 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 for your sake. I think sometimes we, we think we're supposed to get excited about our sufferings. We're like, yeah, the Bible says rejoice in your sufferings. Not really. The Bible says to rejoice in your sufferings when it's for the sake of others. It's extending yourself on behalf of others. It's, it's hurting and being willing to go through pain for the sake of others. And this is what Paul's talking about. Paul never would fathom going out there and suffering and being like, man, this is awesome. I love suffering. Because that's nonsense, right? And, and we would burn out and we would die. We would wither up and die. But Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, now listen to this, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. There's a reason for Paul's suffering. And it's not just so that he can suffer and, and you know, have another peg on the board and be like, yep, I suffered another day. Paul's suffering for one purpose and one purpose only. To help present all Christians mature before Christ. Isn't that cool? Isn't that important? 
contrast that with what's going on right now. Church is splitting and dividing over, you name it, pick an issue. And churches are splitting and dividing over this. And I don't want people to hear this. If people are tuning in online and they're first hearing this, I don't, I don't want anybody to hear this as a rebuke on our congregation because our congregation is quite the opposite. In fact, I've been pretty vocal about bragging about this congregation that I feel like we're really uh, maturing in Christ in this congregation. We're not fighting and splitting over, over these issues. We've joined together. We've banded together. We've, uh, you know, we're using common sense. Um, we're respectful towards each other and helpful for one another. And I think that's what sets this congregation apart from a lot of these other congregations that are splitting. Is that a lot of, a lot of Christians have these signs, they exhibit these signs of immaturity. We don't want to change. Um... I'm offended. I want my freedom. You know, all these things. And people are just barking and barking and barking. And the point is this. Nobody feels like anybody else really notices them anymore. In those churches that are splitting and dividing over this, Christians feel like, they don't, one, they don't know their purpose, and two, they don't feel like anybody is really exerting themselves on behalf of somebody else. Can you imagine our kids if we weren't willing to suffer for them? I don't know of any normal parent alive who's not willing to suffer for the sake of their child. If you've ever talked to a, to a parent who's had a child get sick, especially terminally sick, normal parents will say, I would gladly take the place of that kid. I would gladly take the place and suffer and endure the pain so that my kid didn't have to. You see, as Christians, it should be no different. We should be willing, we should be rejoicing in our sufferings on behalf of other Christians. We should be willing to sacrifice our time, our money, our energy, our efforts, and suffer on behalf of Christians to help present them mature before Christ. And Paul says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And then chapter 2, where Bill read, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. And for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Paul's not telling them he's struggling on behalf of them to make them feel bad. It's quite the opposite. Paul's telling them that I'm struggling for you. I want you to know that I'm struggling for you. I want you to know that you have value, that you have worth, that your soul means something. Verse 2, and that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. This, this word for being knit together was a shipping term. It was a, a blend of two words, together and literally ship. People who are boarding a ship. It's interesting, right? Once you're on a ship and that ship takes off from the dock. If you want to escape, where are you going to go? You can't escape, right? It's this, it's this idea, Paul's using this word, that's this idea, this picture of being bound together, being on the same boat, being in it together. We're heading out to sea, we're knit together, we're bound together, we're inseparable. Paul says, I want your hearts to be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Uh, that word for plausible is, is something like um, persuasive arguments. Uh, the word for delude means deception. Paul's saying, I'm, I'm exerting myself. I'm suffering on behalf of you so that people don't come in with these persuasive arguments and pull you away. I want you to be presented before Christ as a mature Christian. All of you. 
And then verse 5, Paul says, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Period. That's cool. So my message for you is, uh, one, basically keep doing what you're doing as Christians. Keep checking in on people. Keep writing letters to other to fellow believers. Keep picking up the phone and calling people and checking in on them. But don't just do it because you're like, well, you know, got to get our six calls in this week or whatever. Do it because of this. Be willing to struggle and suffer and be willing to call and give of your time so that people can be presented mature before Christ because their faith matters. I think one of the great things about this congregation is nobody, at least not that I've heard ever, throughout this whole last six months, never has anybody looked down on anybody who's not been here in person and been like, well, they're using, you know, they're using their COVID card. I've not heard it. I've heard nothing but respect from these members towards other members, and that's cool, and that's awesome, and I think that's a huge sign of maturity. So I want to encourage you this week, even if we can't be together um, physically with people, uh, we can be joined together with our hearts, being knit together in love, as Paul says. If there's anybody this morning who's not yet put Christ on a baptism or anybody who has any prayer needs, we would encourage you to come up. Or shepherds will be in the back. You can go see them as we all stand and sing together. Let's sing.